Yes, Nancy says we've we've got it. Okay, so tonight's topic um, is near and dear to my heart, especially during this kind of cold and flu season. Not sure about you, but around me, a lot of people are getting sick. It's almost as though we've been trapped in our houses for three years, and now we're getting out into the world, and all of those colds and flus that we escaped over all those years are coming to get us. It's almost as if, <laughs> and I'm definitely seeing this. Many of my family members, colleagues at work, um, people I know have been down for the count um, over the last little while. Seasonal transition, you know, we just had a big kind of kind of crazy um, full moon eclipse, which took a lot of people out emotionally. And that's when you get sick. Um, so I noticed this is quite a pattern. When we're emotionally tuned out or stressed or overworked or overwhelmed, that's when our immune system crashes. So remember to be good to yourself. Remember to take time. And we're going to start by talking a bit about that kind of stuff, how to support our immune system outside of just herbs. But just as a, I'll, I'll re-echo this later, but be good to yourself. Um, emotional, mental fatigue is compromising the immune system as much as uh, you know, vac viruses and bacteria in pathogens in your environment are. So plenty of times I've been, you know, doing really well and feeling immunosavvy and nourishing myself and eating well. And I don't get sick when other people do. Other times when I get sick, it's usually because I'm overwhelmed and overworked more often than just because my diet's not good or because I'm um, around a bunch of pathogens. And because we're always going to be around many different pathogenic organisms. And just as another quick sort of insight here is that it's many of these, what we call pathogens that actually shape our resilience and build our core health. Uh, there was a concept in a movie once I saw, and I thought this was great. Aliens came and invaded the planet and, you know, they dominated us and we had no ability to take them out except for our viruses and bacteria did because <laughs> we had built up immuno uh, systems to protect us from those. And so sometimes getting sick is actually part of our building resilience. So don't give yourself a hard time. Just make sure that if you're getting sick, it's flowing and moving and not staying stagnant. That's when we get into deep immunological problems and so much more. All right, so let's do this. <clears throat> so before we get started, I'm going to um, really just start with a little story about harmonic arts. Uh, in this picture, you can see my lovely family. This is my wife, uh, Angela, and she is part mermaid, I like to say, really because she's into seaweeds. We moved to the West Coast 18 years ago after graduating our clinical herbalist diplomas at Wild Rose College, which is an amazing herb school. I'm totally biased, but I think it's one of the best educations in plant medicine you can get. Anyway, um, <clears throat> we tried to be practitioners and we realized everyone in their dog out here had a level two Reiki or Shiatsu healing, or everyone was a bit of a DIY uh, healer in their own regards. Lots of people connecting with medicine, wanting to connect with good health, many people shopping in health food stores, but there wasn't really access to a lot of the types of medicines that we wanted to work with, with our clients and with people, good quality tinctures, uh, nice good herbal teas that were loose leaf and not um, bagged teas from America. Um, we were seeing like a real lack in that and just wanting to provide that and support that. So we started Harmonic Arts really as a farmer's market booth in our local farmer's market and kind of grew it from there, um, recognizing that a lot of the stores were also missing this gap of having some really good high quality herbal medicine to support their customers with. Me being an avid mushroom uh, fanatic, um, I, I've been into medicinal mushrooms since I was in my early, early, well, in my teens, really. I started to learn about reishi from my father and some of these other mushrooms. I actually ended up naming my daughter reishi, um, who's now 22, so I've been into mushrooms for longer than that. But the reality is, is as Harmonic Arts grew, we continually looked to find uh, the best quality uh, products that we could work with, best quality vendors, both farms and brokers that were bringing in great herbs and great um, things, as well as to make sure we were formulating potent and effective and easy to use remedies. So that's kind of our story a little bit. That's what we do. Uh, we're also one of these companies that is big about sustainability. Uh, you know, we do these canisters that are compostable. We try to uh, minimize on the packaging and have a compostable tea um, packages now and are just really always trying to be as low impact um, that way. And we're on our kind of 1% for the planet journey where we have been continually giving back 1% of all the sales. You'll 
see on many of our products, it's probably hard to see up here in my little thing, but it's a little 1% logo. Um, this means basically we give back to the forest, really is what we give to um, the Cumberland Forest Society, which is in our little mountain town to protect the second growth forest to become old growth forest. And then also we've been just on this journey lately of doing the B Corp certifications. And that's been amazing for Harmonic Arts because we're now vetting a lot of our vendors to make sure that they uh, have ethical practices around their farming practices, they're paying fair wages and all of these kinds of things. So that's been a big part of our journey is how do we be a business that is the change in the world um, that we want to see and really just keep knowing we have a big impact and how do we make that matter and make that more potent. So anyway, I highly recommend you check out B Corps in general. Um, there's some great B Corp businesses out there, but that's what we've been doing lately. And yeah, support with your dollar, yada, yada, yada. You got the drill. Okay. So, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're talking about the immune system today. And so I want to just start with the basics of you've got an immune system everywhere. Everywhere in your body is your immune system. Your skin is part of your immune system. Your digestive system is um, part of your immune system. Your uh, thymus, your lymphatic nodes, all of your mucous membranes, uh, all of your tonsils, all the way into your bone marrow, right? So there's, there's a lot of pieces to our immune system. So it's not really like this one system, like we'd see the nervous system or the digestive system um, or the elimination system or whatever you might want to think. The immune system incorporates every part of our body. And then, as I mentioned to begin with, uh, you know, when we're emotionally and mentally stressed out, that affects our immune system too. The way I like to see it is as we have, and this is from a Chinese perspective, a, a TCM, Chinese medicine perspective, it's called Wei Qi, which is defensive Qi. So we have this like protective barrier around us. And that is psychically as well as physically. And when that gets penetrated, when our Wei tree Qi gets penetrated, we become more vulnerable. So you can easily get an infection from an open skin wound, but also as things go into your airways, as they go through your digestive tract, you can get an infection that way. So remember to nourish all these parts of the body, but all of these pieces of our body are just the backup immune system because our true immune system, our actual um, protectors, Hi everyone. I think Yaro is frozen. Let's right. just we'll give him a second to yeah. uh, reboot and jump back on. Um, oh, that might be him. You're back. Okay, I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> Sorry, um, my power literally just went out at my house. The whole house went <clears throat> and came right back up again. This is one of the challenges of living in the country. Um, so appreciate your patience. Sorry, everyone. Um, yeah, that was quite interesting. I was like, really. <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of mentioning. Hopefully, my power doesn't go out, and um, I'm hoping that we get um, good internet connection. I might be glitchy. I'm using my phone right now as my power, <laughs> so um, yeah, it might be a little glitchy. But um, yeah, as I was saying, uh, the immune system is all in our body, but our real immune system is our microbiome our 10,000 foot soldiers that line our gut, that are on our skin. These are our true immunological protectors. So it's 
one of the most important things that we do as a key to our immunity is actually build up a good microbiome. And there's a lot of ways to do that. And it's not always just through taking probiotics. A big part of it, and something I'm a big fan of, is creating what we call permaculture gut design. And that is to build up better quality gut um, flora through all of our um, fibers and things like that, yam skins, broccoli stems, you name it. There's a number of uh, medicinal mushrooms that really work to support our probiotics, it's creating more of that, what we call like leaflet within the gut and to encourage better quality diversity, just like in an ecosystem, it becomes stable when there's more diverse organisms versus one single monocrop. We see that time and time again with the way we press agriculture. But anyway, um, let's get on to some of the different aspects of the immune system. We wanted to break this down into deep immunity and surface immunity. And the reason is, is that they are totally different things. Our deep immunity is when something gets in, when something gets past our surface guard, when it gets through our systems and in deep into our body. Whereas the surface immunity is what most of us consider our basic seasonal short-term illnesses, coughs and colds and flus, even things like corona is a surface immune infection until it becomes that long COVID. And a few studies have been now after with people who have long COVID looking at actually stool samples and measuring the microbiome. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that most people that have the worst long COVID actually have poor quality microbiome health. So they've actually got not such good gut flora. Here's a great aha to just why um, we, we want to protect and keep our um, gut flora in the best health. But on our surface level, we have all these protective layers. I mentioned the skin. We have this oil layer on our skin. I will invite you to um, not overly soap and shampoo and continually rub the oil off of your skin. Now, it's important to be clean, right? But we are seeing that it takes a lot of energy for our body to rebuild back that oil layer on the skin, if we're continually scrubbing it down with soap um, every single day in the shower, we're over soaping, then that's actually compromising our immune system. Uh, we want to have a bit of a surface, surface protection. Think of the oil layer, the lipid layer on your skin as part of your Wei Qi, part of your defensive Qi. We also want to make sure we have good stomach acid. A lot of people these days are hypoacidic. Even those who get heartburn, it's typically because they've had low acidity, and then there's the mucous membranes at the top of the stomach are not um, being hit by acid as much. So when something's churning, they splash and you get this kind of heartburn type symptoms. Um, often that's still hypoacidic. So things like even just apple cider vinegar is a great one to increase the stomach acid. You can get things like betaine HCL and work with things like that. We've got some great digestive herbs. I did mention right at the beginning how I love trying people's bitters. Bitters are great for the digestion. Uh, we might also, favorite herb of mine is one called Meadowsweet that we use in a bunch of our teas and in our digestive harmony tincture. So um, those are that's a great herb to help create better stomach acid. So skin, stomach acid, these are primary defenses. So is our gut flora, as I mentioned. Uh, and that's just like uh, I had said, creating permaculture gut design is super important. Another piece of that is to just make sure, I'm just going to see if I got better internet here because my house is back up. Maybe it's working, so I'm not off my phone. Sorry about that. Um, yep. We're, we're not creating a hyper uh, immune um, state, right? Where we're getting a lot of inflammation in the gut. And so this comes down to the foods we eat. One of the big things that I've seen as of the last number of years is a lot of people with irritable bowel, with Crohn's, with uh, gluten intolerance, a lot of inflammation in the gut. And one of the easiest ways to tell um, somebody has inflammation in the gut is well, obviously, if, they, if they're having pain in their digestion, uh, but also sometimes on the, the stomach, we can see from a fractal map on the lips, if they got a lot of chapped lips and kind of dryness there, it's likely that 
they have a similar thing going on inside of their gut. They get a lot of eczema and psoriasis. It's potential that they have a lot of inflammation inside the digestive tract as well. So um, these are key indicators that we want to nourish the gut um, mucous membranes and to nourish the microvilli and help protect our gut. Um, so how do we do that? A real simple way that I've seen is being good to yourself with digestive teas, eating more alkaline versus acidic foods, getting more antioxidants, getting more fiber, getting more um, chewing. If you're if you're eating, and this is a common issue that's happened in North America and North American diet, is that we typically eat fairly mushy food without a lot of fiber in it. And most meals, we think of that as like um, higher quality, but actually if we don't chew enough, it doesn't help our teeth and our um, immune system in our mouth, and we get more cavities if we're not eating more fibrous foods, but also it doesn't help our digestive leaf litter and protecting um, the microbiome and soothing inflammation in the gut lining. So getting a lot more vegetables um, and more fibrous, maybe less overcooked vegetables, uh, and those kind of things are important for us to think about. Another piece I will say is Roundup ready wheat and other glyphosate ready um, Monsanto crops. I'm not going to go on the whole rant about all that, but just know that those have been known to kill all kinds of pests in their environment. They do the same thing in our body. So when we're eating a lot of that kind of food or if we're eating a lot of animals that uh, have been feeding on those kind of grains, maybe we think beef is okay, but if it's been eating GMO grains, well... Um, it's probably creating some of that same issue. I'm not going to belittle the whole concept of the gut flora and the microbiome, but just know that that is one of the most important places to work on our health if we want to have good immune protection, as well as our skin, like I mentioned. So the kind of symptoms of these, as we know, cough and cold, we're going to talk about herbs like echinacea, golden seal, and usnea there. Now let's just dive into deep immunity for a second. This is deeper in our body. When things get past that surface level of defense, we get into our lymphatic system is kind of like the back alleys of the body. We were sort of taught in school that it's, it's like where, yeah, it's the elimination of toxins, but you need to move the body. So simple, simple thing is lymphatic massaging or swimming or rebounding or just going for walks, move your body. If you're somebody who sits in an office and does work on a computer, get up and move your body every so often, every 90 minutes, kind of shake things off. Even I like to do sometimes if I'm feeling sick, a little lymphatic tapping, light tapping here, here, um, all into my lymph glands, into my, my um, armpits and in between in the, my thighs and just kind of move stagnation. All disease comes from stagnation. And this is a really key, important thing to think about, both physical and mental and spiritual. It all comes from stagnation, whether it's stagnant thoughts, stagnant practices, stagnant um, community or friends, or <clears throat> stagnancy in our diet or in our body. When things get stuck, they break down. As they break down, they create more inflammation due to creating friction, heat, pain, send a signal to the body that we've got to do something or else we're going to have an issue. So we want to make sure that we're always getting our lymphatic system moving. We also know that deep breathing has a massive ability to support our immune system. There's been a number of uh, different types of breathing practices. Uh, probably the most common right now that's most popular anyway is Wim Hof breathing and how and igniting the deep lungs, that's almost like hyper breathing, uh, has the capacity to actually really protect the body. Now, we want to do this in small amounts. I've also been reading that uh, exhaling for a longer period of time, low, slow exhales. So breathing in for four seconds, hold for seven, exhale for eight. Um, this is a great way to ignite the deep lungs and to try and extend that exhale. Uh, there's a number of things like that we can do. Even one cool breathing thing that I, I learned was, was to um, breathe, breathe out and then hold your nose and shake your head. And it like helps to like move some of the stagnation in the, in the nasal cavity if we're needing to do a little bit of nasal clearing, right? Always, if you can, breathe through your nose versus your mouth. 
breathing through your mouth is probably one of the worst things you can do for your immune system. So um, having good immunological health, breathing is a big part of it. Getting good oxygenation to the cells, helping move stagnation and keep things going as well as, yeah, lengthening the breath. And every once in a while doing some hyper breathing while not driving a vehicle, by the way, while sitting in a meditative state is, is a great thing. Um, so deep lungs are part of our, our deep immunity and our bone marrow, which is really where a lot of our uh, our white blood cells are produced. All our T lymphocytes and, and, and um, all of our T cells and stuff are produced in the bone marrow. So um, yeah, making sure we're nourishing all of that part of the body is part of our deep immunity. This often we can see people with deep immune issues have chronic long-term illnesses or that cough that just doesn't go away. You were sick for four days, but then you had this cough for another month. And that month, um, that's where it's starting to get deeper into that deep infection, um, symptoms like bronchitis, or even just some of these kind of deeper immune stuff. I will also mention that's what's not on here, but is part of deep immunity is autoimmune stuff. Um, typically, we have the immune system going opposite of itself, and we start to create these autoimmune cascades, and that's a really big problem too. Some of that stems from gut flora and allergens getting into the system. Some of that stems from overstressed, overworked type A people that are go, 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 can do everything, and then one day crash. Um, that's a big thing to consider. We see a lot of autoimmune states come out of really healthy people who seem like they had great immune systems for a long time, but they were never giving themselves a rest. So make sure you're resting. And some of those herbs that are good for deep immunes, like the mushrooms and astragalus, are actually herbs we can use for autoimmune states too, where our immune system is attacking itself. We have and an autoimmune state, just in case you don't know, is where we're over immune, not just deficient immune, where we've got sickness. It's where our immune system starts fighting our healthy cells because it sees them as a threat. Um, yeah, these are things like even irritable bowel to a degree, but Crohn's for sure, and fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue, and types of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and there's a number of other Hashimoto's. There's a ton of autoimmune diseases, and nowadays we're seeing more and more and more of this stuff um, because the system of the food system we're eating, the lifestyle system we're eating, is so far removed from our ancestors that it's been you know, it's been a challenge for our, our bodies to keep up with the social demands of our times. All right. So here we go. So let's just talk about a couple of lifestyle things before we get into the herbs, and then we'll talk about the herbs. And the reason we wanted to add this stuff in and not just talk about herbs is that herbs are not magic bullets. A lot of people want to see a herb, like I want to take echinacea and it's going to make my immune system strong and protect me. But, you know, if you're not doing all this other stuff, well, then, and you're relying just on the echinacea, it's not going to work. Uh, you need a bit of both. You need a bit of a holistic lens to how we approach keeping ourselves resilient, especially in these changing times. I think resiliency is a superpower uh, if we train to be resilient based on giving ourselves good quality herbs and quality tonic adaptogens and those kind of things, but also getting things like adequate sleep. Make sure you're resting, getting some Shavasana. I'm not a great sleeper myself. Um, I have never have been. I come from a family of chronic insomniacs, um, but my dad taught me this when I was younger. He's like, look, as long as you get one good long REM cycle, uh, if you can do cat naps and extra regular little like slowdowns throughout the day, this can really give your immune system and your body time to rest and reset. And so I've been finding that to be really useful for me. I get at least six hours of sleep a night, usually, um, but very rarely do I get eight to 10. And so it's advice I'm trying to take for myself as winter comes in, it's far easier to get more sleep for me, but I've had to build in uh, cat naps into my day and I love it. I just love it. It helps to slow me down. Um, and I'm even wearing these blue blockers because the, the, and these, that's what these are anyway, it's because the light um, in here is that blue light coming off my computer. And that also excites my nervous system. So um, of course, speaking excites my nervous system too. <laughs> so, um, but the blue blockers help a little bit to wind me down. So I'm in candlelight mode versus blue screen mode. And I highly recommend that for you. Um, yeah, try not to watch TV late at night. Um, that's a great part of getting good rest. Make sure you get time in nature. This is huge. 
I can't say enough how nature deficit disorder is one of the major root causes of most imbalances in our world. Most people are not getting time out in nature and just even being around the geometry of um, plants and the soundscape of animals and rustling leaves, it helps to heal our body, but so does the terpene profile from the tree needles. When you smell in all of those different types of um, chemistry that are in a natural environment, those are all protective for the immune system. Now, of course, pollens during pollen season can sometimes cause an immunological response. So, you know, word to the wise, um, if you have pollen allergies, there are lots of things you can do to support your gut flora to protect that, but also um, maybe not trying to huff in a lot of pollen, but especially in the winter months here, if you have a, tr a forest that has conifers of some form, um, there's lots of terpenes in those tree needles. Get out and take some time in nature and not just go for a run, Go for a meander, slow down and sip the moment, you know, um, take a bit of time to chew on your thoughts as you move slowly in the wintertime. Antioxidant rich diet and just really diet in general is a, is a huge piece of the immune system. There's a reason why we're attracted to bright colors in food. And it's really because typically the bright colors are what had the antioxidants in old world. That's where all the berries were, right? So um, we like those bright colors because from a, I guess, a biologically hardwired place, survival place, we think, or our brains think, that bright colored foods are gonna give us more antioxidants. So we wanna get those in our body. Uh, there's lots of great foods that, just think of the like, it's the colors in the foods that are a lot of those antioxidants. What do they do? They help to protect us from free radical damage and oxygenation or oxidation of the cells. So our cells each live longer, but also, helping protect the cardiovascular system, uh, helping to support the microbiome. There's just a ton that phenolic compounds and antioxidants and all these flavonoid groups do for us. So yeah, make sure you get those. And that means like eating the skins of a lot of fruits and vegetables as well. That's where more of the antioxidants are. So don't peel your carrots if you can or peel your grapes. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, there are some foods like Here's an example of something old world knowledge that I thought was really cool. I learned once ketchup. Yeah. You know, ketchup, the modern staple condiment, the red sauce of not good health. Well, originally ketchup was a fermented tomato paste that was made in order to increase the lycopene content and bioavailability of lycopene in tomatoes. And lycopene is their major antioxidant that is in tomatoes. So in a way, in order to get more antioxidants in the winter, they would ferment a lot of those foods. Um, and ketchup was a classic example of a fermented condiment that increased your antioxidant potential. So I know ketchup today is not like that, but um, if we go back to some of this old world knowledge, we realize that many of these ferments and many of the condiments that we have today have a history or roots in being health add-ins. Relish, pickles, uh, mustard, they're all like that. Um, so yeah, this brings me to, I'll just skip a couple things here into really eating ferments and taking prebiotics and working with probiotics. I'm not a big fan of probiotic capsules. I find that most of the time those are not very effective. It's much better to do fermented foods uh, and to get more of that kind of thing and to help to create better gut design by supporting the ecosystem, the terrain, versus just trying to repopulate with probiotics that are usually, you know, not very well adapted to the ecosystem inside of us. <clears throat> okay, that really leads me into avoiding like processed foods and uh, the like kind of last, I'm going to put these two together. Um, well, I'll do one more too. I'll say, um, besides like movement and getting that extra time in nature, like I mentioned, make sure you're doing seasonal appropriate diet. Um, so you're, and you're doing cleansing and detoxifying throughout that. So seasonal appropriate diet means not eating a lot of cold leafy vegetables in the middle of winter. That's soup season or eating more nourishing warm foods during the winter months, more preserved foods, more fermented foods during this season as we come into here. And then in the spring, that's when it really starts to become leafy green season again. And all those greens have 
bitter digestives that help to stimulate the liver and get the, the digestive system moving again after the winter kind of lull. So those are more like seasonally appropriate as well as seasonally appropriate cleansing. I see a lot of people who like to do a cleanse, but they do it at New Year's and that's not usually the best time. It's the cold, harshest time of winter. Do a spring cleanse if you are gonna do a cleanse. At Harmonic Arts, what we recommend is a diet that is very much what the Wild Rose Detox diet is. That is 80% neutral and alkaline foods, no sugars, no um, no fermented beverages like beers and wines, no uh, simple carbs like flour products, no tropical fruits, anything that's really sweet in the system or simple carbohydrate, eliminate all that out. And then we suggest you do like our liver TLC tincture and our clear kidney tincture, as well as a digestive tincture. Those three together, as well as taking maybe a couple of different teas is a great cleanse. You can do that in the spring and the fall. You know, that basically is built on the same premise as the Wild Rose Detox, a little different, but um, yeah, cleanse the kidneys, cleanse the liver, cleanse the digestive system once or twice a year is a huge piece of increasing our immune protection. Okay, last thing I'll say is be good to yourself, self-care routines, um, whatever that is for you. If it means doing a yoga class, if it means having a bath, if it means, you know, laying in your bed with tea and reading poetry or a good novel, do some self-care routines. Um, make sure you are taking time to not just worker mode, but really to nourish yourself on those levels. Okie dokie. So are you ready to talk about herbs? Thanks for letting me share some other thoughts on immune system, because I think it's really important for us to consider that it's not just these herbs, right? So the first one we're going to talk about is echinacea. This one is the, I don't know if it's like the most it's sort of the iconic um, immune herb in a sense. You see, a, if you go to a health food store, you'll see a lot of echinacea, a bunch of different brands, a bunch of different types, um, a bunch of different compound types of echinacea, or it's in different formulas. This isn't almost every immune formula I see, including ours. Um, we put it in our cold defense and our throat spray and our defensive arts tea. And there's a reason. So first off, Echinacea is a composite flower, and the composite family are these flowers which basically produce one, how I was taught from my one of my herb teachers, and I love this, is they're a bunch of little, they're a bunch of ladies who wear one party dress, and they've made it really efficient to get impregnated, in a sense, um, by having lots of little seed heads or um, ovaries inside of one dress. So one bee comes along, pollinates them all, and it only takes that one visit and they all are able to produce seed. Why this is important and why I'm saying this is that this whole family of composite flowers, because of that efficiency, they've developed strategies to build some of the most bioactive chemistry of all of our herbs. So <clears throat> some of our top, top medicines are in this composite family. And echinacea is just a prime example of that sunflower style herb, right? That's the sunflower family. Herbs like elecampane, which we'll talk about, herbs like um, dandelion, echinacea, you know, uh, calendula, many of our top herbs, a lot of great herbs are in this family. And echinacea, because of this capacity to reproduce with efficiency, has also generated um, a real strong immunological potential in its roots and in its seeds. Uh, it has these phenolic compounds that are quite strong. And if you eat an echinacea seed, it will start to make your tongue numb with all the phenols in it. These are very immunostimulating and they help to really generate a better macrophage activity within our uh, white blood cells, or not with our white blood cells, our, our, um, our immune cells, <clears throat> all of the macrophages start to like turn on and really get our immune system at that high level of defense. So I think echinacea is one of those great herbs. You can take it regularly. Um, there are some different indications on the internet. Some people say, oh, you can't take it for too long. But a lot of that came out of an early commission E study where they saw a significant decrease in the echinacea uh, and they read the study wrong because it was in German and it got sort of translated as um, echinacea doesn't work after, I think it was like 90 days, but really they had stopped giving the echinacea to the to the people, and then it still had a prolonged effect for even longer than they gave it to them. So here's one that I consider a regular staple during cold and flu season. It's got those phenolic compounds, like I mentioned, but it also has 
these branch polysaccharides, which are something we see in the medicinal mushrooms and um, in astragalus and, and even in usnea, there's a little bit of that. And the branch polysaccharides are immunomodulating. So they help to stabilize the immune system and protect it from, I say, some over, over heightened immune. I will say though, echinacea, because of its polyphenols, is more of an immunostimulant than immunomodulant, meaning it stimulates the immune system and is one of those herbs to be cautious of during autoimmune states. So if somebody has a lot of autoimmune issues, echinacea might not be the right herb for them. But that being said, it is one of my favorite herbs as a leader of the formula, as the primary herb in a formula. So it is the top herb in our cold defense, not because it's the best at fighting immunological attacks, or it's not the most antiviral, it's not the most antibacterial, but it has this overarching capacity to really turn on the whole immune system. And so it's a great one that way. Uh, there are some <clears throat> studies showing like hormonal support with echinacea. We also see that it's been commonly used to relieve coughs and sore, sore throats. Uh, it has antibacterial qualities. And a big part of how it works is it reduces inflammation in the throat, in the lungs, uh, in the digestive tract. Yeah, in a bunch of things like that. So I'm a big fan of echinacea. I will say, sorry, that, that one of the things I would I wanted to also mention is just that it is full of antioxidants and that's that's a big part of it. Hence why I, I believe in taking echinacea fairly regularly during cold and flu season. Um, so if that's the case, that's where our like def defense artisan tea is a great one to be taking regularly. It is the base of our cold defense and that is specifically for an acute immune issue. So what else about echinacea? Um, it has slight antiviral properties, nowhere near it as good as most of the other ones. Um, and it doesn't really like, it's one of those ones that, um, leaves a strong flavor in the mouth. I prefer it as a tincture. That's where you get your high bioactive polyphenols. So really our cold defense and our throat spray are where you're going to get more of those immune stimulating effects. Whereas the defense T, you're going to get more of those immune protective qualities. So if you're looking for those phenolic groups, you want to use a good quality echinacea. Um, we use echinacea purpurea and echinacea angustifolia. Um, they're both amazing herbs. Purpurea is the one that grows in our local ecosystem, whereas angustifolia is the one that would grow better in a colder climate like Alberta. So um, yeah, the other thing about that is um, one thing that's a little different from Harmonic Arts versus some other companies is that we individually tincture each herb. And the reason this is important is because each herb has a different type of bioactive chemistry. And a lot of people will put all of their herbs together and then put that in alcohol to make the tincture. What happens there is only the strongest personalities that are most solvent in the amount of alcohol that are in there come out into the tincture. What we like to do is tincture each herb individually. And echinacea is an example of a herb that likes 65% alcohol gives echinacea the best kind of polyphenol profile. And it really pulls out a lot of those bioactives. So that's what we do. And then we individually tincture each herb, put them together afterwards to create a more bioeffective tincture um, versus tincturing all your herbs in the same batch of alcohol. Okay, so uh, the next one we wanna talk about, which is kind of pretty classic in the health food store, you see echinacea and you see golden seal. Echinacea golden seal is a classic I personally have a little bit, I mean, I'm over it now, but a little bit of PTSD from my mom feeding me golden seal as a kid. Every time we got sick, the yellow tincture that tasted like death came out and it's very bitter. Um, this is a strong tincture, but you know, it works so well. And there's a reason my mom kept feeding that many to that, that to me as a kid, um, because yeah, it's, it's potent and it works really, really well. Golden seal is a low shade plant that only grows in intact ecosystems. Hence, it's actually endangered, um, but you can, and nowadays, it's very, very hard to find wild golden seal. It does grow out eastern Canada. Um, we do see a little bit of it there, naturalized, but the reality is, is most golden seal now comes from a farm, which is a good thing. I do believe that we should be supporting um, organic agriculture over wild foraging these days. There's just too many of us, and only unless the herbs are really biodense, like a big patch of nettles or a good patch of Oregon grape or something, that's when we should wild forage. But otherwise, I really encourage organic agriculture because we know that there's sustainability there. Um, so golden seal is one of those ones. It's a three-year crop. 
uh, that divides by root division, these beautiful little golden threads of a root underground, um, and then these little nodules. We grind that up into a powder, we make that into a tincture, um, and golden seal becomes probably one of the most um, immunostimulating um, and antibacterial tinctures we know of. There's a, it's been called or nicknamed king of the mucous membranes. And this is really because it clears the mucous membranes, helps the mucous membranes fight off infection, pull out a clear, clean mucus, really moving catarrh out of the body. And here's another quick tip for your immune system is when you are producing mucus, spit it out, get it out of you. Don't swallow it back. Um, don't try to push it down. Don't try to stop coughs actually like get them out of you that is your body shedding and that is a way of elimination so consider mucus as part of your elimination your eliminatory channel you want to move that out of you so yeah definitely encourage that and once a cold becomes more of those like dry hack non-productive kind of cold then it's going deeper into the system so if we got a wet cough yeah get that out move that out as much as we can and Golden seal helps to moisten the lungs and increase that mucosal stimulation to actually push out an infection. These alkaloids in it are called barberini, and we do see them in a number of other herbs. So there are analogs for golden seal if you're concerned about sensitivity of it, or you want to wild forage and craft up some of your own. Here on the West Coast, we've got one called organ grape, and it's got a lot of that barberini in the root bark of the organ grape. So you can totally make that into a tincture. It's another one, the alkaloids like this, they require high alcohol content. So make sure you're definitely, if you are making your own tinctures, you're using uh, usually 70 to 80% alcohol for golden seal. That's what we do. I think we use 70% and it really pulls out those alkaloids most effectively. That being said, golden seal is actually the most potent of all of these. So organ grape is one, coptis is another, goldenrod um, that grows in eastern Canada and all around other parts like that. That's another great herb. And I think barberry is another one. So there's a number that have barberini in them, but it is one of the most effective compounds for antibacterial qualities. So it's very antimicrobial. It has some antiviral properties to it too, um, but really for clearing the mucous membranes, healing the lungs, supporting the microbiome. It's antifungal. So we're going to see golden seal help protect us from candida and all that kind of stuff too. So yeah, so that's why echinacea and golden seal oops, are, are together. I will say though, our cold defense, I've had a number of people mention to me how much more effective they think the cold defense formula is than a regular echinacea golden seal tincture. So you can definitely buy echinacea and golden seal together. We use both of them with a couple of other herbs because I feel like a more well-rounded formula actually has a more therapeutic diversity and more therapeutic action. So golden seal might be king of the mucous membranes with a big, strong alkaloid that comes in and um, really kills pathogens. But we have this other one called Usnia, and this is also in our cold defense. And this one is awesome. I consider this like the Shaolin ninja of the immune system because Usnia is gentle. It helps to combat fever and infection and sore throats and, and respiratory tract issues. It helps the forest actually breathe better in the forest. And really a lichen is an interesting organism in general. And I'll talk about its, its health benefits. But first, what blows me away is that this is not really a plant or anything. It's actually three different organisms living in symbiosis. So this is considered the poster child of symbiosis is, is lichens. And Usnia being the most heavily studied immunologically protective lichen that really has antibacterial qualities too. It's got a fungal cell wall with a chlorophyll algae um, kind of um, building in photosynthesis. And then the fungal cell wall is using enzymatic extraction to pull um, minerals out of the air and the tree and all of it and root it down. And then it has a photosynthetic bacteria in it. So there's three organisms here that have lived in coherence together for so long that they can't live apart. And so what looks like one organism is actually three put together. This teaches us a lot or gives me a lot of aha moments around how we need to build better relationships with other organisms, not just humans. So how do we do that from a macro lens uh, with our planet, um, with the or ecosystems we live in? Um, how do we build not just relationships with our pets, like our dogs and cats, but with the other organisms in our ecosystem? 
Anyway, I think that's where we'll find better immunological health. And Usnia, one of the cool things about this one is it's super gentle. It tastes gentle. It's It goes down easy. It's a very much a, a gentle herb. You wouldn't think it has such immunological protection, but what it does is it actually stimulates um, and stops bacteria from reproducing. So it stimulates this anti kind of reproductive chemistry. It shuts down bacteria's ATP or their ability cash, we'll say. So one of the best strategies that bacteria have is they reproduce every 20 minutes or even less, and they can adapt and modulate to the environment quickly and modify themselves. Well, Usnia helps to shut down their capacity to reproduce. And in this way, it actually works more like the Shaolin Ninja of like, hit you right here once and oh, now I can't move my neck. Oh no, what do I do? Kind of that kind of thing. It stops bacteria's reproduction. Therefore, um, works on a much more subtle level and is gentle and has this sort of soothing quality to it and almost um, nourishing our lungs and helping our breathing respiratory tract and lung ways in that way. So here's one of the gentle warriors the peaceful warrior <laughs> of the immune system. Whereas the golden seal and the echinacea, they come in with spears and arrows and you know big artillery or whatever it is. They've got strong chemistry that really like has a straight um, firewall kind of effect to pathogens. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about antivirals. And maybe before we do, I'm going to jump in. I see 11 Q and A's. That's awesome. I'm going to do a couple of Q and A's. I'll just Shut down the slideshow for just a second. We'll do a couple of Q and A's and get back to our main story in a minute. We'll talk about elderberries next. So, um, all right, let's see. Um, first question from Amanda is really, do we do patient consultations? Angie and I don't do patient consultations anymore. Um, we were when we first started, it's just been too busy. And um, I'm now mostly doing these kinds of things. So this is where I get to work. And also on YouTube, I've got a Purple Jedi YouTube channel and do a lot of work there. Uh, I work with the Canadian Herb Conference and we build out places for people to connect with herbal medicine through Wild Rose College and all of these kind of things. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, so yeah, we don't do that at this point. Um, but <clears throat> um, maybe one day, when I retire, I'll retire into clinic. <laughs> so that might be that kind of thing. Um, okay, so Jake is asking about speaking to managing an overactive lymphatic system in children. And I'm not 100% sure what Jake is meaning about overactive because um, the lymphatic system is, first off, it is just a bunch of valves. So it um, maybe if they've got like lymphatic infections, that might be another thing. And needing lymphatic draining, um, maybe Jake is going to ask another one in the chat. I see that. Um, enlarged lymph nodes. Okay. Thank you, Jake. Jake. Um, yeah. So this is where we need lymphatic draining, lymphatic um, decongesting. And, and honestly, it's about stagnation here. You're talking about. Um, so part of that, even those things I was doing like this, one of the things that I've um, seen work really well is actually ear candling. I know that sounds weird, but ear candling is not about clearing wax out of the ears. And what it is, for those of you who don't know, is you actually light this hollow tube of wax and it burns down and you need to have a protective plate and do this safely. But what it does actually, and you can do this with newspaper, you can do this with grass, with a reed, you just need a hollow vacuum. The real benefit of ear candling is draining and creating a vacuum for all the sinuses and all of the lymphocytes and all of the lymphatic tissues in the head. So one way to do to in, um, enlarged lymph nodes that way is, is that. Another thing that you might see, Jake, and this just depends on the age of the child, if they're entering their hormonal years, there could be some hormonal stuff going on. If it's not, if they're really young, then yeah, they're they're backed up. And so again, working on all of the other aspects of health, like the digestive system, there are some lymphatic herbs like mullen helps support the lymph system. So do cleavers, uh, doing a little bit of kidney supportive herbs will help to drain fluids, um, making sure they're trampolining or doing that kind of thing or swimming or active, all these things can help. Um, but yeah, your candling is one. Um, lymphatic herbs, gentle detoxing, cleansing in the spring and fall are all things that might support that. And that's about as much time as I got for that one right now, Jake. But yeah, hopefully that helps. 
Um, okay, Stacy's asking, I know a person who had some brownish mucus for more than five years after very severe flu. What remedy therapies do you suggest? So first off, um, it depends on how much mucus. Brownish scares me because it sounds, I mean, maybe it's not, but blood turns brown after it's stagnant. So the like red blood is fresh blood, but brown blood is stagnant old blood. So I would be careful there. I'd want to um, probably have them go see a specialist if it's five years, you know, that way. But at the same time, outside of that, the remedy I would say, Stacey, is working on lung health in general. So get them to do some deep, um, deep, deep, uh, like, like breathing practices, learn a few of the um, kind of the, the deep breathing practices is one. Also, even there's like some things you can do, like, like these sort of chest beating, um, circles, crawls across, really work out the chest that way. And then herbal wise, we're going to talk about elecampane. That's one of my very, very favorite herbs. I often give people who have, it's a lung tonic. So elecampane, it's in our lung tea, or you can get it as a tincture on its own. It's probably my favorite one that I give to asthmatics and people who have like deep chest stuff. Now, brownish mucus, mem um, mucus, yeah, brownish mucus, it could just be a lot of tar and cleansing in there, but my concern would be blood that's stagnant. So I would just make sure you have that checked a little bit. Um, yeah, as well as, do some of the lung cleansing, breathing, all that stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so Leslie's asking, what is the best type of best way to rebuild your gut after an antibiotic? So we're going to have to give that one a whole nother talk, Leslie, because there's a lot we can do there, but I've already jumped on the whole um, good prebiotics, uh, things like fermented foods, good fiber, um, your, you know, branch polysaccharides, your medicinal mushrooms are one of the best. So I'm a huge fan of adding in our five mushroom blend to really support people for building up their microbiome after antibiotics. Um, those things I think are more important than taking probiotics, but you might want to pair that with probiotics. You also want to get rid of inflammatory foods uh, and simple carbohydrates that feed yeasts in your gut. So just more slow digesting foods um, is really important there too. So that's what we can say for now, but we could do a whole webinar just on rebuilding the gut flora because it's really that big of a topic and there's tons, tons to learn about it and different ways, strategies of how to like actually kill pathogens and then recolonize and all that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> all right. Um, so I'm going to just answer just two more questions and then we're going to get back to our story and um, I'll get a couple of quick ones here. Judith is saying, can you use Uzni as a tea? Yes, totally. Here's one that you can make into a tea. I like to mash it though first. So bruise it almost like you would, um, was it muddling when you muddle peppermint in, in um, uh, sugar for a mojito or something? I would bruise the Uznia and then make a tea. Um, and then Nancy's asking about golden seal regularly. And this is something I meant to talk about earlier and we'll totally address now because I think it's super important. <clears throat> any of these herbs that are antifungal, anti antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral, antiparasitic, antimicrobial, they're all slightly anti-life. So just be careful with any of those herbs long-term. Golden seal is definitely not good to take long-term. Echinacea, sort of, <clears throat> you can take it fairly regularly, but golden seal is a warrior that you only need for short bouts. You only need it for short periods of time. So I tend to think golden seal is better off being used in like two week windows at a max and then take a break. Um, yeah. And then um, along with that, June is asking, would golden seal be appropriate for someone with autoimmune issues stimulating um, since it's stimulating? No. An organ grape? No. I would say or grape is really effective for the mucous membranes, <clears throat> but not quite as golden seal. Although typically I give organ grape to kids more than golden seal because it's gentler. So if I was using it as an analog, I would use it for kids more organ grape um, than golden seal. <clears throat> I don't give golden seal to breastfeeding mums. Um, it's not great for autoimmune. It's a specific immunostimulant that combats infection. Very effective, but in its specific circle. Think of this like really rowdy warrior and you get him, you take him to the ballet and he's just like, rah, 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 disturbing everybody, making a mess of the place. Like, no, not the good place. Anyway, maybe that's a bad analogy, but you get the idea. Okay. Um, so thanks everyone. Keep asking more questions. 
I will try to get to them all, um, but I'm going to go back to our screen share so we keep going through for our antivirals here. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about <clears throat> is elderberry. And the reason I do a Q&A in the middle is because I've found time and time again, I get to the end and there's like way too many questions and <clears throat> we don't even get through half of them. <laughs> so um, at least we got through half of them already. <clears throat> so elderberry is, as I'm going to have a little sip of my little elderberry mocktail here. P.S. This is my favorite way to do elderberry. I also like elderberry syrup on pancakes. <laughs> it's a little bit gourmet, might be a bit expensive for some of you, but it's one of my favorites. Um, we love to use the syrups on, on things like that, or elderberry syrup on ice cream or on yogurt. Amazing. But elderberry syrup on bubbly water, just so great. So <clears throat> anyway, um, elderberry strengthens the immune system and it really is a natural defense. It's something I really start using regularly during cold and flu season. I think of this as one I can take a little longer term. It doesn't have this like negative effect. So I will always have a bottle of elderberry syrup in the house. Usually in cold and flu season, I'll have two bottles of elderberry syrup or one of elder ginger or some other kind of similar syrup. I actually like to make my own, even though we do it harmonic arts, we got fresh elderberries here. And so I love to make fresh elderberry syrup at my house um, because I can make a lot and have a great, um, great amount of syrup. And then we can take it in big amounts. Um, but I will say like for a natural um, sort of just regular immune protection during cold and flu season, I'm taking a tablespoon. Um, but when it comes to getting cold, I'm usually taking a half ounce, maybe twice a day. So I'm getting a lot higher dosage. I like to really up the dose on this one if I'm starting to get sick for colds and flus. Um, but yeah, in September, I'm starting to take this one. My kids go back to school, they're taking elderberry syrup. Uh, we're all just using a little bit of that antiviral, antimicrobial, antibacterial quality that elderberry packs. Now I did mention those are all anti-life, um, but this one's a lot gentler. So a little bit I won't use it all year long, but it's definitely one that I'm picking up regularly and using regularly during those seasons. And it packs a lot of antioxidants and vitamin C. Um, so it's got a lot of those flavonoid groups. Just like we mentioned in the beginning, the choke cherry has a lot of those too. Um, that's something you could use. Any of those, <clears throat> I'll say wild berries like that are going to have um, quite a bit of antioxidants. One of my favorites in um, Alberta when I lived there was the silver leaf buffalo berry. That one is amazing. So there's a number of like every ecosystem that's cold usually has like a, a berry in it that can help as an immune protectant. Um, elderberry just happens to be way more antiviral and antimicrobial than most of them. And it has a really interesting history. So I highly recommend you look into the folklore of elderberry and the elder more, the elder mother. She's the queen of the underworld. And so the deity of elderberry is this underworld deity that, that helps to fight against underworld pathogens, those unseen critters that we can't um, see. But, you know, there's all kinds of fables like don't leave your baby sleeping under an elderberry tree or the elder moor will take it away, all kinds of things like that. Um, but it is, has been used a long time in Europe as an anti-plague, anti-pathogenic herb as a protective one. And the irony is the entire plant is poisonous other than the berries. So here's a plant that's totally toxic. All the leaves, all the stems, all of the branches, everything except for the berries. Um, so yeah, the, the way it works, which I think is super cool, and I did mention this earlier, but it, it is a um, biofilm disruptor. And we've been learning more and more about this, especially because of COVID. All the virology and viral sciences have just kind of become way more um, open and people are learning a ton more and it's more exposed to more common knowledge. But most viruses, how they insert is through kind of a lock and key system to get into the cell. Well, as biofilm disruptors actually protect the cell from these, these keys getting in and they also mark the virus when it tries to. So the immune system sees this and can tag it. I like to think of elderberry as like, it's like paintball. It, once it tags virus, now the um, the white blood cells can recognize it and start to build antibodies to get rid of the virus. Other than that, we can't get rid of viruses. And I will mention one thing about viruses. <clears throat> They're not all bad. We've got this big hate on bacteria and virus, but really 
They are the titans of our planet that have shaped this planet, and they are our ancestors. They're not our enemies. They're our ancestors. And our DNA is made up of viral RNA. A lot of it, there's, there's over 8% of the DNA is actually viral load that has used, we've strategically inserted viral DNA into our, or RNA into our DNA in order to protect us against pathogenic bacteria. So viruses aren't all bad. It's just some of them are pathogenic. And typically that has a lot to do with an ecosystem imbalance. Think of them as a check and balance system. We as a species, I hate to say it, we're kind of out of coherence with our ecosystem and kind of out of balance with our planet. And so this is not the end of our viral attacks. I'm, I just, I feel as though learning a bit more about how to be immuno savvy in the world right now is a key um, supporter of our own resilience. How do we strategically build up stronger immune systems and um, create good um, body knowledge, but also have some good herbs around us that can support us uh, no matter what comes our way. Cause it's all about terrain. How is our terrain and how is our ecosystem? And that's a big part of our immune system. And so these are herbs like that that can support. Anyway, enough about that. Um, let's keep going. So one of my favorite antivirals, which is very different from elderberry. Elderberry is very gentle, but OSHA is very, very strong. And this is one of the stronger, kind of like the golden seal. And we do put it into our cold defense because we want a blend that has more effects for bronchial and lung and viral load as well as bacterial load. So we're really using that cold defense as a, a cure-all for any kind of pathogen that comes at us and creates an immunological response or an acute immunological response, a cold or flu. And OSHA opens up the lungs. It has this just great deep respiratory effect. It really soothes the lung tissue um, and helps with a lot of coughs and colds. So I, I just think this is one of those reopening the lung herbs. It's got a lot of phenolic compounds. So you feel this like phenolic spike up into your nose when you um, taste the OSHA, a little bit of spice. So it's like moving the stagnancy in the, the, the respiratory system. This is part of the reason it has a nickname bear root and bear root really stands basically is indicative of the bears dig it up in the spring to kind of clear their mucous membranes and to like get themselves breathing better again. So OSHA is a classic herb that's commonly drunk or, or eaten in the spring by bears. So is skunk cabbage. It's another one that has some of those qualities, but very different from OSHA. Anyway, it's um, <clears throat> extremely antiviral. Um, and there's not a lot of herbs like it. There are definitely some other ones. Rat root is one um, in Alberta or Northern Alberta that I have used. <clears throat> the calum <clears throat> calamus, um, herbs like that, <clears throat> that can be like this. I like to just chew on OSHA root, but um, we make it into a tincture. We also put it into a syrup and it's really great in the lung and cough syrup. That is one of my very favorite products at Harmonic Arts is our lung and cough syrup. The amount of people that I've just seen as well as myself. Um, just, I create, I use it as a bit of a sipping cordial. I've given it to my dad who's had a long-term um, kind of a like, like he just from flying on airplanes for so long, so many years, he has this like kind of residual cough that he's had for years. The cold, the lung and cough syrup is like the best thing he's ever found to really support. So he doesn't get that long-term cold and cough. So for those kind of like dry, non-productive coughs, Here's a great herb to really stimulate that. Also with that antiviral, it cleanses and protects the liver against different types of toxins. And it's just a really protective herb. So OSHA is one of my favorites, um, but you do want to use it sparingly. Um, this is one that we're trying to see more people replant and the people we're working with are doing a very ethical job of harvesting it, but there are some uh, limitations to working with OSHA. Okay. And so, yeah, it's one of my favorites though. And I just love how it affects the body and it really works for my lungs. I can feel it. It's a powerful herb that has a really big personality um, and it's the root that we're using. Anyway, great one. Okay, herbs for deep immunity. Um, let me do a quick time check here. 710. All right, I'm gonna fly through this and then we'll get to the question and answers at the end. Um, so we'll just wait on that for a second. And yeah, first off, astragalus, great herb. This one is top-notch, deep immune herb, very popular in Chinese medicine. Um, commonly, astragalus is put into broths and soups, made into kind of bone broths or as that 
uh, deep immune herb. It has a sweet flavor. Another name is sweet vetch. Um, it has like this really gentle, yummy kind of flavor to it. And it is quite sweet. Um, it looks sort of like a pea. You can grow this. We grew this at the farm in Alberta when I lived there. And I've grown it here. It's We've got some growing, some a little bit of a stragglers growing. Um, it's not doing as well on the West Coast as it did in Alberta, um, but I think it's going to be fine. Um, but yeah, it generally boosts the immune system and wards off bacteria and viruses, helps protect the cells from radicals and really helps the body adapt to stress. But the bigger thing with astragalus is it's got that deep immune nourishment and it's got an affinity for the lungs as well. So it's just kind of this deep immune herb that uh, we put into our immune depth tincture, which is really to support the immune system when we're not sick or when we've been sick for a long time. We get to that deep immune state. That's when we use astragalus. It's not a problem to use during surface immune health. It's just that it does have that really deep nourishing to the immune system and really stimulating. Part of that is because it has a lot of branched polysaccharides in it, which are more of those immunological or immunomodulating qualities we see in the mushrooms. So astragalus has a great flavor. My favorite as a tea, I mean, we do our defense tea, but I love astragalus, reishi, and goji berry tea. This is out of TCM. Um, so reishi slices and goji berries with astragalus. You can do the same thing with astragalus and rose hips and maybe a chaga or a medicinal mushroom from here, um, a tinder conch, you know, but I, I really think that astragalus and mushrooms together with some kind of, uh, we'll say flavonoid rich vitamin C berry and rose hips would totally take that. Um, elderberry would be good. So in our tea, we do have astragalus and elderberry um, both as part of that. And so they kind of have that combination. Love to pair this one with the berry, but also love to pair it into bone broth. So sometimes I'll just take a little tablespoon or two of astragalus and put it into my bone broth. If I'm making it anytime from like October till March, if we're making bone broth with uh, um, bones of something we've eaten, well, then astragalus is going in there. Okay. Usually, usually I throw some weird mushrooms and some usnea and some stragglers into all my bone broths. A lot of them anyway. Here's my, one of my favorite herbs of the day. And it's also in that lung and cough syrup. I know there's a lot of great herbs here, but elecampane is just, oh, it's a favorite of mine because it's a deep lung tonic. And I just, I've seen it work time and time again for people uh, when they have deep respiratory stuff, when they've got that stuck cold, the shallow breathing, uh, congestion in the chest, pain in the chest, uh, bronchitis, asthma. A number of people I know who are asthmatics have used elecampain as a way to really help to get that almost like a puffer. They'll use the elecampane tincture to increase their, their lungs and just to open them up and get that lung tonic. I think it works much better when taken regularly, not in acute states like you would use a puffer for, but actually taken a little more regularly. If somebody has um, asthma or gets a lot of allergies and just lung congestion in general, even that person, and I, I was sort of mentioning this, that has that brown mucus for five years. Yeah, elecampane is the herb of choice from my perspective. You can get it as a single tincture, but really the lung and cough syrup, that's my favorite way. It really is. It's got the, the OSHA, which opens the lungs, and it has the elecampane together, as well as it has some other herbs that calm down the lungs. And so it's just a great blend. We do put it into our breathe tea, and the breathe tea is a lung tea. So the defense tea is much more about straight just supporting the immune system. The breathe tea is more once we've got an infection or we've got some kind of chest thing building up, that's the tea I go to. That with a little bit of honey. Hmm. Honey is a great one to add into immune teas in general because it slowly coats and is a bit anti-inflammatory in its effect. Also, it tastes good. Now, you don't want to overdo the honey. You know, some people, sweet is a problem, but um, yeah, a little bit of honey in your, your tea is, is, is a good thing when it comes to lung coating, right? Um, making it almost more like a syrup in that sense. Okay. Um, and that just has a better effect. So Ella campaign just in... In closing of this one, lung tonic, deep lung tonic. It's in that compositive family like the echinacea is, and it's got a big gnarly root that really, really supports the immune system in a big way. Okay, so um, let's talk about a couple of mushrooms. Just really deep dive. Now, we do other talks on mushrooms. I want to just right now say, if you haven't checked it out yet, 
We have a website called harmonicartslive.ca. And um, Julian, if you could put that into the chat, that'd be awesome. That website is where we do all of our live webinars. So that's where they all live. And we have great webinars just on medicinal mushrooms. So we'll go deeper into that. We did one last October uh, on, an, or well, last October, like a month ago on mushrooms. That is parked there now. Um, many, there's many different ones. So if you want a deep dive on mushrooms, please go there. But first off, uh, that being said, um, they are some of the best immunomodulants and deep immune support we've got. So I'm a big fan of adding in turkey tail, or even in my drink here, what I made is I put a little bit of our five mushroom tincture in because it gently modulates the immune system. Um, it keeps us from getting sick. I like to think of turkey tail and reishi and chaga and those kind of mushrooms as more like the engineers that build the moat and build the walls and protect and fortify the castle so that when the Mongolian horde comes or the infection comes to get us, uh, we are protected, right? Um, so this one gently modulates the immune system. It helps to restore the microbiome. And remember, those are the 10,000 foot soldiers that line our gut and our, our skin. They um, help give us that extra level of protection. Well, turkey tail is really great at anti-inflammatory effects in the microbiome, as well as it's been used for all kinds of, it's probably the biggest claim to fame is it's used for things like cancer treatment and in conjunction with chemotherapy when um, used together, helps to combat some of the radiation and to help the body recognize the tumor cells and to help to get the immune system able to fight that. So yeah, it also contains some antiviral qualities though. So it has been heavily used for things like liver viruses like um, hep C and also HIV and a couple of things like that. Uh, it's not as, um, it's, it's an immune antiviral, but it's not like OSHA where you've got this really strong chemistry or echinacea where you, or barberini and the golden seal or the phenols in echinacea. It's got a much more gentle kind of terpene profile, which is a bit stronger, but um, doesn't have as the same effects. We'll see the turkey tail as one of those ones that we can kind of work with. Oops, sorry. In, how do I go back? Ah, going back, sorry. Turkey tail is something that we would do in a capsule. This is new to us. Harmonic Arts has just released capsules really because so many of our customers are saying, we love tinctures, we love powders, but we use capsules regularly. Probably the number one feedback um, that we've gotten is that, hey, we really want to work with these mushrooms can we get them in a capsule? I'm still a big fan of the powders, always will be. I like to taste my medicine. I think it's great. Um, the powders taste great, but this is one you can get in our viral support tincture, um, or you can get it in our five mushroom tincture, capsule, powder, or on its own in a tincture, capsule, or powder. Um, yeah, okay. So let's talk about chaga. Chaga is one of the great immune supportive mushrooms, over 200 phyto nutrients in this. It's got germanium, it's got manganese, it's got zinc, it's got copper, it's got a ton of minerals, it's got all kinds of betulinic acid, superoxide dismutase, polyphenols, it's got crazy good stuff in it. And so it is really antioxidant, really strengthening and restoring to our immune system, and really supports um, fighting infections and as an anti-inflammatory. So I'm a big fan of chaga tea on the stove, during cold and flu season. So regularly, we'll drink chaga tea in our family. And or one of the beauties of our chaga powder is you take a little quarter teaspoon, you put it into hot water, and now you have an instant tea. Think of that, those mushroom powders as instant tea mushrooms. So you can put them into your coffee, put them into your tea, put them into your water, um, preferably hot water because they blend better. But yeah, this is a great medicine. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say for now, just due to time. But you can go back and check out some of our other webinars on chaga. And this one, our syrup is amazing. I've had a number of people, well, I had one person in particular who was like, I use this as a vanilla extract now. It tastes like vanilla. It has vanillic acids in it. She puts it in her baking with the chaga syrup now. Uh, I thought that was great. But I have had a number of people tell me that they love it, just like I'm doing this. Chaga syrup on bubbly water is amazing. It's like a vanilla cream soda. Um, so yeah, pretty good. Chaga tincture is a great one too. And of course, this can come in a capsule, powder, or tincture. I will say, one thing I'll say here is seven out of 10 people, I would give all five mushrooms to. So I give the five mushroom blend over an individual. 
So if you're thinking about working with mushrooms for immune health, think about going to the five mushroom blend. That is going to be a wider diversity of polysaccharides, more diversity of terpenes, and just a great um, profile to support the immune system in general. So last mushroom of the day to talk about is reishi. This is the one that I would put into the water supply of every city I visit <laughs> if I could, because I feel like it's grounding and calming down um, anxiety and tension and stress and bringing people back into their body and supporting their immune system and so, so much more. Um, it has an anti-inflammatory effect. It helps protect us from radiation and EMF damage. It's just grounding and adaptogenic. So one of my top herbs for resiliency in the modern age is reishi. And I just think this is meditation in a bottle. This is a little bit of uh, longevity enhancement, a little bit of immune support, and really helping combat like tension and anxiety and stress and insomnia and all of these things, lowering our our heart palpitations and cholesterol and blood pressure and just really supporting the body in a lot of ways. So that's all I'm going to say about Reishi for now. Um, just know that this is my very favorite as far as uh, medicines these days. It's hard to have a favorite. There's all, so many great ones. I just think that Reishi is the one that is most universal for the most people and has a big ability to support our overall health. We do put it into our immune depth. We put it into our mushroom blend. Um, it is in our adapt tea as well. Um, there's reishi slices in that. Um, so you can find it in those. It's an easy one to work with in many different ways. It's bitter though. I will remind you, if you haven't tried reishi before, it's got a strong personality. Um, those are the terpenes. And that means it's good reishi. If you have a reishi that's really bland and doesn't have any flavor, it has none of the terpenes. So if you're buying mycelium powders or mycelium capsules or mycelium tinctures versus fruiting bodies, you're not getting a lot of those profiles. So just a quick reminder that the fruiting bodies are where we see these bioactives in much wider amounts. So really make sure if you're choosing medicinal mushrooms, that's what you're working with um, to get the actual overall immuno modulating benefits. There are some definitely in the mycelium, but the fruiting bodies have more of those polyphenols and terpenes and ergosterols and all those other great chemistry that really support and enhance our immune system. Okay, I'm seeing the questions build up. So I'm gonna just rip through the last couple of slides here. Tinctures are easy to use. Um, we've got a couple of different things around that. We use alcohol because it's a great solvent. It helps to pull out uh, the bioactives and makes it really quickly absorbable and um, digestive. Now there's a small amount of alcohol. Some people are very against alcohol and I totally get that. We have an issue with alcohol in our society, but as a taxi driver in herbal medicine, it's one of the most effective ways to pull out that chemistry. So if you're taking a tincture, think of a 150 ml bottle as less or the same alcohol as in a glass of wine, but you're taking it over 21 days. If you're concerned about kids, I will say that fermenting fruit like uh, ripe bananas and ripe oranges have more alcohol than a shot of tincture. It just tastes strong, right? So it is one of the best ways to extract chemistry. It's far better than glycerin. It's far better than oil for a lot of herbs. It's far better than a lot of things. So I am a big fan of tinctures because I think that they not only bypass digestion and have quick absorption, they create high potency herbal extracts if done right. Okay, with dosing, we want to look at, um, if we're looking at kids, remember that you want to look at body mass index. If kids are half your size or a quarter your size, dose appropriately. Make sure they're taking much lower doses. Don't dose kids under two with tinctures, really. I've got a three-year-old and he's been taking tinctures for a while, but usually we put them in a bit of water or a little bit of apple juice, and that's a great way to go, just a tiny amount. Drop dosage, though, is my favorite way to start with tinctures, and that is ethereal doses. It's very small amounts in order to pick up the subtleties and the nuance of the medicine itself. A physiological dose in most cases is uh, one to three milliliters twice a day. All of our tinctures have a milliliter dropper on there, so you can see how much you're actually getting. Uh, it's indicated on the glass pipette. But when it comes to immunological health, if it's something like cold defense, I am almost automatically going into hero dosing. This is not what's presented on the label, but is how I like to use um, things during a cold and flu. It's an acute attack of the immune system. So we wanna use um, moderate to strong reinforcement from our herbal community. So taking one to two milliliters 
is not going to cut it. If we're doing that, I'm going to do that six, seven, eight, ten times that day versus twice that day. So I prefer to actually do hero dosing and do like four to eight milliliters, two to three times a day sometimes with cold defense, but I'm only going to use it for days max. I'm not going to use it for longer. So that one bottle, instead of being 21 days of small dosing becomes uh, eight days of large dosing, right? So um, user beware, obviously tinctures can be strong. Don't go overboard, but in my recommendation, in my experience, hero dosing is one of the best ways to work with things like cold defense in an immunological attack. Remember that some of these herbs are anti-life if we take them long-term. And so, yeah, just a little bit about dosing there. Um, and yeah, again, um, if you've got somebody who's really big or really insensitive, say they can drink 17 cups of coffee and barely feel it, probably they need more. If you have somebody who's um, very sensitive, they drink half a cup of coffee and they're bouncing off the walls, probably they need less of the tincture, right? And same with size matters when it comes to that. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. These are just some of the ways we work with. It's mushrooms, it's syrups, and it's tinctures. That's our favorite way to work with them. Thanks for joining me. I will um, answer a bunch of Q&A now because we've got a few questions piling up. And that's great. I'm sticking around for another 10 minutes. Although I will say um, this webinar is set to go till 7.30 PST. So that's in three minutes. I'm still going to stick around for another 10 minutes um, to answer some questions. But if you have more, you want to learn more about how we work with herbs, please check out the blogs on harmonicarts.ca. we got lots of great content there, as well as our, follow us on Instagram, because these um, our team is doing an awesome job. They're putting together some great recipes, some great um, advice and ways to work with our products. So you can learn a lot from our social media team on Instagram. Love what they've been putting out these days. And just want to, again, invite you to harmonicartslive.ca is another place you can learn from some of our past webinars and go through and look at some of the things we've shared more about. This is one of our goals as a plant medicine company is to be the change we want to see in the world. So we continually are putting out as much uh, free content and education and ways to work with herbs beyond just trying to sell you products, really, like how do you engage your health to be as resilient and um, supported as you can be um, so that you can be a bit of a medicine bridge for yourself, your family, and your community. And that's kind of our goal is to connect you and those in your community and in our community with plant medicine. All right. Thanks for joining me on all of this and look forward to tuning in with you at the next webinar. For now, I'm just going to jump into some Q&A and appreciating you all. Okay. Um, so... Um, yeah, Juliana, if you got things you can answer in there, um, please do. Five mushroom in my coffee. Good one. I see that. <laughs> I'm a big fan of coffee as a taxi driver, just like um, tea is and just like chocolate is and just like alcohol is. Um, tinctures. Yeah, we can drive in the mushrooms. Okay, so I'm going to start up with some questions that I got about 35 minutes ago. Um, when making bitters, this is from Nancy, when making bitters, should you brew them separately, then mix them into your tinctures? Ideally, you want to, I mean, there's certain things you can extract altogether, but I'm a big fan of extracting each individually and then blending the liquids together to get the best out of them. Now, when I'm making like a mead or a tea uh, and a water extract, I'm often I mean, in a water extract, I'm brewing things a lot together. Um, so yeah, that's going to be a bit of one of those questions, Nancy, where you could do one or the other. We found for tincturing, it's far better to extract each herb individually and then put them together as liquid. That way you get the best quality out of each herb. Because some herbs, like in the cold defense, we've got marshmallow, and it prefers a very low alcohol to get those demulcent qualities out so that we get this nice soothing tincture. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a big believer in that. Our bitters is awesome, by the way. Our Harmonic Arts Bitters is one of my favorites. I've taste tested it against a bunch of others, and I'm super stoked about how much ours stands up as one of the best bitters. And it's another one that I would normally make a little mocktail with. Anyway, uh, okay. Patty is asking, in terms of eating raw veggies in cold winter, what if I have lettuce still thriving in Vancouver? It's an anomaly. <laughs> it's growing beautifully in your biome. I mean, uh, um, and grated cabbage and um, fermented beets. I mean, fermented beets is, yeah, on top. This is all awesome, Patty. Like you're eating like 
way better than the average person. Uh, if you're growing your own vegetables, please don't let me say it's a crime against wisdom to eat lettuce in the winter and, and listen to that. Listen to your own garden. If you've got vegetables in there growing, eat those. Like how awesome is that to have lettuce still growing in the winter? It's just less intuitive when you um, to be eating cold foods in colder climates It's or during cold seasons. It's harder a little bit on our digestive system, but you know, I'm a big fan of like grated cabbage. I'm a big fan though of fermenting that stuff too, like making our, um, and if we look at, if we look at just old world traditions, we see that winter meals are classically like, like cabbage was made into cabbage rolls at this time of year or sauerkraut, things that preserve them longer. Um, yeah. Lentil stew is amazing, right? Like, so there's a lot of things, fermented beets. Those are all great. Um, I think you're doing great um, that way, Patty. Uh, but I will just say for those of us who don't have access to a thriving garden in the winter months, and you're choosing food from a store or a farmer's market or from a restaurant, just think about what is seasonally appropriate and what is in tune. It teaches your body to show up in that season based on that season more, right? So again, like I'm often getting soups this time of year. I'm like, what's your soup? If I'm going to a restaurant, what's your soup? Oh, okay. You know, I, I'll get broths. Um, I'm not a huge fan of pho anymore, but sometimes I'll get ramen and or pho. And it's like, it's about the broth, right? Making sure that I'm getting a good quality, of course. Uh, but yeah, we eat a lot of vegetables in the winter, but mostly they're pickles and sauerkrauts at this time of year for us and my family. Okay. Um, what would you recommend for autoimmune illnesses like colitis? Well, <clears throat> this is a whole one. This is from um, Katia. <clears throat> this is another bigger topic. I'm going to just give you a couple of things really lightly. It's the diet, of course. Huge piece of that is diet. Uh, making sure you've got a lot of um, foods that are anti-inflammatory in there. I'm going to think about things like medicinal mushrooms. Make sure you get good uh, vit B vitamins as well as good oils. Omega essential fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. So your omega-3s and 6s, um, they'll also help coat the lining. Um, B yeah, this is a whole thing. It's slightly autoimmune. The medicinal mushrooms are kind of the first place I go, um, but this might take, usually with colitis, Katia, to be honest, I, I prefer to see people work alongside a practitioner and kind of modulate and tweak their diet and take a bit more time to educate deeper on this. Now, there's tons of information on the wood, the World Wide Web. Um, so there's loads of articles and information you can learn on it. Sometimes you get over, information overload. It is nice to work with somebody directly if you have the capacity to. But yeah, start with anti-inflammatories, or, or B vitamins, some omegas, and definitely medicinal mushrooms. So even things like a little bit of turmeric golden milk can have a little bit of anti-inflammatory effect. Lots of good fibrous um, foods to build back the microbiome if their colitis is not too extreme where they can't eat that kind of stuff anymore. Um, okay. Um, and posted a question late in the chat. Um, but with parasite cleansing trending, um, might golden seal be helpful for breaking down mucous membrane lining biofilm? Golden seal is great for parasites. Um, I will say though, you may want to like work with other herbs too. Um, I'm a big fan of the wormwood, black walnut, clove, cinnamon, thyme. Uh, those are some great herbs. Spices in general, spice up your life. Most of the spices are kind of anti-parasite and actually a lot of spices in your foods. Like just, we didn't talk about things like garlic and ginger, but man, are they ever great for your immune system? You know, my, my family's been sick. I'm the only one not sick right now. I'm knocking on wood here. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of garlic and I'm like chopping up garlic, adding a little bit of olive oil to it, taking it by the spoonful. Um, and that's strong. But then I'll be drinking tea and elderberry syrup and um, taking cold defense. And yeah, I'm totally trying to do all those things. So, but anyway, with parasites in mind, golden seal is definitely useful, but um, it's something that you want to do Specifically, when I consider parasites, I like to think about these herbs are strong that we're going to use as our like our parasite purge at Harmonic Arts is super strong. Um, I like to do it in take breaks. So it's like three weeks on, then take at least a week or two off. Then we also like to dose it heavy around the full moon when most parasites lay their eggs. So just consider up dosing herbs during full moon times for parasites in that sense. Okay. 
Um, Laura is asking if a herb like golden seal moistens the lung and helps expel catarrh, would it be useful to be um, best avoid in cases of COPD? Yeah, and pneumonia. Yes and no. Um, we want to, if we've got too much fluid in the lungs, um, we do want to get those mucous membranes working. I've not seen golden seal actually as a problem during pneumonia. It's it's not, it's not um. I don't know if it's moistening the lungs as much as maybe I miss said that it's more that it's stimulating the mucous membranes to produce and move and expel out um, things like that. So yeah, it's something we may, we may want to be careful with, but I don't, I don't see that as a super problem, Laura, but thanks for bringing that up because pneumonia and COPD. Um, yeah. You want to have a little more drying of the lungs out, but we're not, we don't want to turn them into non-productive. We want to get that out. So this is where I'm also a fan of like actually doing steams and, and getting, getting the eliminatory system moving as much as we can. Um, so trying to do things more like that's where the lung tonics, like the elecampane and those types of things would come in handy. And that's where I might go for that. Okay. Nancy is asking, what can I take on a long, um, uh, uh, take on a regular basis for phlegm in my throat. Hmm. Maybe there's an allergen in your diet. This is what I would say. Maybe the bigger thing to look at Nancy is what is in my diet that's causing long-term regular phlegm in my throat. Um, and that might be, uh, things like what, what are, you know, are, are you allergic to something? Are you eating dairy? Um, is it, is it something, I don't know. And so these would be things to think about. Um, and then, you know, there are herbs that are definitely gentle. I like, I'm thinking of cherry bark. That's a good one. Um, that's gentle, uh, on the throat. You may end up doing some kind of lozenge of some form. A lot of people who have regular phlegm end up getting addicted to like fishermen's friends and those kind of like lozenges, you know? Um, and if you're clearing your throat a lot, I think it's often an allergy and that's a bigger part to look at deeper. Um, what might that be? Okay. Katrina is asking, is the lung and cough syrup safe to use with infants and toddlers? Totally safe for toddlers. Infants, again, I mentioned under two. I don't like to give them very much. Um, and so, but yeah, it's definitely a safe blend that I've used with my three-year-old. Um, no problem. I think we were even using it with him when he was two. We gave him a little bit of lung and cough syrup. But really, yeah, at that age, no problem. Syrups are gentler than tinctures. They taste better. Can kids have better compliance with them? So yeah, we've we've got just so many customers and um, friends that use both elderberry and lung and cough syrup. Um, yeah, babe. And I see just one quick in the chat here. What's your favorite HA product for a long COVID? Medicinal mushrooms. I really, I'm really just, I think those are the main thing. The five mushroom blends, that's, that's what I would work with. Rebuild back the terrain, right? This is the most important thing to rebuild the terrain. Um, if somebody's got like some kind of symptomology, like issues with their breathing and they're having a hard time that way. And there's like an actual acute symptom that's coming along with the long COVID where they're really shortness of breath. Then I'm looking at, okay, let's do some breathing practices and that like lung and cough or lung tonics like elecampane. Those are where I'm going for that, but that's more symptomatic. The long run, we're trying to build back the strength of the overall immune system. So adaptogens and medicinal mushrooms come to mind for me. Okay. All right, guys. Um, I got just a, well, there's just a few more questions. I'll stick around for just a couple more. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I can get through most of this. Um, all right. Uh, Katrina is asking, is there anything um, you'd recommend for someone who has ma who has had mono? Yeah. I mean, again, um, some of the antiviral herbs, um, regular, um, is, is something I would be looking at, um, doing a regular, regular cleansing too. So, so I want to take this back to the basics for a lot of these long-term things, chronic stuff, past events, do a regular cleanse every year, do a spring cleanse, build your immune system. When you're in a strong, healthy state, don't just look at immune health as when I have an acute infection, when you are healthy, that's when you want to do the most immune work, right? That's when we want to rebuild our system. Do that cleansing when you're in a vital state and consider that as maintenance. It's like, 
instead of trying to do all your taxes at the end of the year and scramble through it, create a spreadsheet and put them in every month, you know, like <laughs> make your job easier. Don't just work on your immune system when you're sick. Really, um, yeah. Like, and so uh, as a spring cleanse, I had mentioned from Harmonic Arts, we suggest a cleansing diet of alkaline foods and um, low acidic foods and no, none of those tropical fruits or sweet foods or flours or sugars or like baked goods, any kind of flour product, all that out of there. It is the basic wild rose detox diet. Uh, and it's a very simple diet. Um, stick with you in your kind of foodscape that is mostly alkaline and not simply broken down carbohydrates um, and that kind of thing. And then um, use a liver and kidney and digestive cleansing. So liver and kidney should always be cleansed together. Whenever you're working on the liver, work on the kidneys. Whenever you're working on the kidneys, work on the liver. And then do some digestive cleansing. And that might be our liver TLC, our kidney clear tincture, our, um, our digestive harmony, either the tea or the, or the tincture, and just kind of work with the diet on that. That would be a basic cleanse for two to three weeks is usually what I suggest. Now you can add in a parasite purge formula or something like that too into that cleanse usually and one last thing i'll say about cleansing because i don't want to go overboard on this strip out all of your building supplements so don't take your medicinal mushrooms while you're cleansing don't take your multivitamins your omega oils get rid of all those supplements and um then use those supplements again after the cleanse so wax on wax off so cleanse a little build a little cleanse a little build a little it's like stretching um yeah so you become more nimble when you stretch. Um, so yeah, do that regularly. And I just think that's a big thing I would do with any of these chronic long-term things. Um, okay, so um, ah, Barb mentions that she likes Colt's foot for a cough. Totally agree with you, Barb. Colt's foot is awesome. It is one of my favorite herbs too. It is actually in that lung and bronchial or lung and cough syrup. Um, and it's in our breathe tea. Um, I didn't, we didn't mention it in tonight's PowerPoint, but cold foot is a great one. It's easy to grow as well in your garden um, or in your kind of lands around you. Doesn't need very much. Deer don't eat it. Um, it's a great one to like have around, um, plant it outside of your yard. Gorilla farm it in your local greenway. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've seen it lots that way. Um, yeah. And so she's just saying keeps it on hand. Um, and then um, another one um, from Zanetta is around, is golden seal good for kids? I did mention for infection, infants and parasites and worms. For parasites, I'm a bigger fan of our parasite purge, personally, than golden seal. Oregon grape is gentler than golden seal, so I would be going to Oregon grape for young kids more so. Garlic is super important with that. All the things that kids aren't going to like, unfortunately, all the parasitic herbs are not very tasty. Cinnamon and thyme. Mm, that's kind of getting a little taste here, but garlic, uh, wormwood, black walnut, clove. Yeah. Oregon grape, golden seal. Those are all great ones. Okay. Hey, thanks everybody. Um, I made it through some questions, got a chance to connect with you all. Hopefully we, um, learned something a little bit about the immune system tonight. And, um, hopefully this was worth your time. Your time is your most valuable resource. So I appreciate you spending it with me tonight, learning some of these things about herbs. I just want to give a big shout out to thank you to Harmonic Arts for continually um, engaging. And our team is just doing an awesome job of engaging our community in bringing you more of this type of learning. So make sure you check out Harmonic Arts uh, live.ca for some past webinars. Subscribe to our, our newsletters and get notifications of some of the stuff we're doing next. And yeah, just keep connecting in with your community, supporting immune system and so much more. All right. You will get a recording and tomorrow you'll get an email with all of that and a special surprise. Okay. Ciao for now. We'll see you all next time.